The earliest representatives of what we are going to call Western civilization were the ancient Greeks. But civilization itself first appeared in the ancient Near East, in a region known as the Fertile Crescent. These Near Eastern cultures would influence in a number of important ways the rise and development of Western civilization. The Fertile Crescent is an area of river valleys in the mostly dry Near East, and the one area where the rainfall and water drainage is sufficient to allow the cultivation of crops. The Fertile Crescent is, appropriate enough, crescent-shaped. It begins in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley at the lower right hand of the map here, in modern-day Iraq, before heading northwest into Syria, and then south again along the Mediterranean coast towards Egypt. Other river civilizations would also appear later on in the east, along the Yellow River in China and the Indus River in India. The ability to grow food along these rivers encouraged population growth, and the people who lived there would ultimately be able to spend parts of their day doing something other than raising food. Over time, these people became better organized in other groups and formed the first cities, usually to help carry out various economic transactions. Once we have cities, we can have civilization, since our word civilization is derived from the Latin word civitas, or city. City dwellers usually spend their time on other specialized trades, meaning that they don't produce their own food. Thus, cities can only develop in areas where farmers are able to produce a surplus that urbanites can buy. Naturally, then, there are some conditions that are necessary before the world's first cities could, could arise. Namely, agricultural conditions needed to be favorable enough to produce a surplus, and human cultures needed to develop sufficiently to enable the kinds of economic interactions necessary to sustain an urban population. As we have seen, cities couldn't arise without some prior inventions and innovations. The first human technological achievement that we know of from the work of archaeologists occurred in what has been called the Paleolithic, or Old Stone Age. At this time, humans lived nomadic lives in small communities. They were known as hunter-gatherers, because they ate what they hunted and gathered. They were able to use fire to cook food, and made tools out of stone and wood, hence the name, the Old Stone Age. Over the course of the Paleolithic Age, mankind invented the bow and arrow, which would become the most advanced tool of its day. Archaeologists believe that the first bows may have been crafted as early as 25,000 BC. The first major transition point for humanity occurred around 8,000 BC, when we moved from the Paleolithic to the Neolithic Age, or the New Stone Age. It appears as if, at about this time, the last Ice Age ended, and the glaciers that covered much of Europe and North America began to melt. Alongside this environmental change, several technological leaps were also made. First, the stone tools of the Paleolithic Age were refined. But even more importantly, the first animals were domesticated. This allowed the development of agriculture, since many humans abandoned a nomadic lifestyle for the settled life of the farmer in small villages. Settled agriculture offers societies a number of advantages, including making starvation less likely through the organization of food supplies. It also means more and more organized labor. For most of human history, most humans worked in agriculture, producing modest surpluses to allow relatively small numbers of people to abandon the farming life for the urban life. Now this transition process didn't happen overnight, and it seems to have taken about 5,000 years before the first true civilizations developed. By that time, humans had also made another major technological advance, the ability to use metals, specifically bronze. Bronze is an even more impressive discovery, since it does not appear naturally, but as an alloy of copper and tin. Now once a culture has developed the methods of bronze production, that culture can be said to have entered the Bronze Age. Now this happened in the Fertile Crescent around 3000 BC, but different cultures developed at different speeds. So technically there is not one date for the beginning of the Bronze Age, but different dates for different societies. We've now covered two of the four key elements of civilization, uh, cities and metals. The third is irrigation. Since the Fertile Crescent is the land between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, the people living there had an advantage regarding irrigation, since water was relatively near at hand to be channeled into fields. Irrigation offers insurance against years in which the rains were insufficient to water the crops. In that case, 
water could be brought in from the rivers to make up the deficit. Irrigation also allowed city organizers to plan out about how many crops could be expected to be grown in any particular season, since extra water could be provided. This enabled greater surpluses and a consistent level of agricultural production, and this breakthrough would make urban living more viable. The last necessary feature of civilization is writing. As you have seen, cities were the places where people gathered to exchange their specialized goods. Therefore, the primary function of early cities was to facilitate economic exchange. Keeping track of complex business transactions could become a major problem, which led to the development of writing. Writing, therefore, was invented to aid in keeping business records, although it would later be put to a number of other uses. Eventually, the leaders of cities would record other records in addition to business records, making cities political hubs as well. With the invention of writing, we can move from prehistoric times into historic times. Writing preserves the details of a society that are necessary to doing history. Prior to writing, we are dependent on archaeology and oral legends to tell us anything about prehistoric peoples. Where we can know some things about the Paleolithic and Neolithic ages, it is really with the Bronze Age that historians can speak with greater confidence about the details of events. Still, people didn't record everything, and archaeology and mythology are still important tools for learning about ancient civilizations. Now that the groundwork has been laid, we can begin to investigate these early civilizations. As I've said, the earliest cities developed around 3200 BC in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley. This valley is also known as Mesopotamia, which is Greek for the land between the rivers, in this case, the Tigris and the Euphrates. The first civilization arose in southern Mesopotamia and has been named Sumeria after one of its primary cities, Sumer. Sumeria was not a unified political state, but rather a number of small, self-governing cities that shared a common culture, and these were small cities, usually no more than 10 miles wide. They also constantly fought each other. Stronger cities would conquer the weaker and establish temporary dominance over a larger region with the ultimate dream of dominating the entire valley. Now, these cities generally wanted to dominate larger areas in order to monopolize control of the water. The larger a single state became, the more efficient the allocation of water resources could become. Generally, though, rival cities saw things differently and were unwilling to simply give in to their neighbors. The first group of people to achieve the dominance over Samaria that everyone wanted were the Akkadians. These Akkadians are named after their city of Akkad, which they built in central Samaria after having migrated into Mesopotamia sometime in the 3000s BC. The king of Akkad was named Sargon, and I have provided you with an image of him here. Sargon came to power sometime around 2371 BC. He conquered the other Sumerian city-states and set himself up as the world's first emperor. An empire is a state that is composed of a number of diverse cultures united under the political control of a single ruler. Eventually, Sargon's state unified all of Mesopotamia, but he went even further. In the east, he conquered up into the Iranian plateau and even marched west into Lebanon on the Mediterranean Sea. Sargon's motivation was to gain access over water, but also to secure control over the region's metals. He was particularly interested in getting access to the region's bronze, lead, silver, and gold. In the end, Sargon and his descendants ruled his empire for about 200 years. As you might have expected, many Sumerians resented the Akkadians and didn't want to remain under their domination. Around 2100 BC, after the Akkadians had held control for two centuries, the city of Ur took advantage of a war that the Akkadians were fighting against an external threat to throw the Akkadians out of Samaria. Ur then set itself up as the next dynasty, which is known as the Third Dynasty of Ur. This dominance lasted for about a century until the Sumerian cities once again successfully gained their independence. Over the next century, uh, in other words until around 1900 BC, Sumeria would remain divided, but outside invasions and migrations would bring so many non-Sumerians into Mesopotamia over this period that the Sumerians lost their common cultural identity. 
Eventually, Mesopotamia would be reunited, although again by non-Sumerians. This time, it was a people known as the Amorites. The empire established by the Amorites is also known as the Old Babylonian Dynasty, since they set up their capital in the city of Babylon along the Euphrates River. The Babylonians would rule for nearly three centuries, quite a record for the time, between 1900 and 1600 BC. The most famous of the Babylonians was the ruler King Hammurabi, who reigned between 1792 and 1750 BC. He is most famous because of the law code that was issued during his reign, and is known as Hammurabi's Code. This code would prove to be the most comprehensive body of law to come out of ancient Mesopotamia. A copy of Hammurabi's Code has been unearthed by archaeologists. It consists of the laws engraved on a rock pillar, with an image of Hammurabi receiving the laws from his god at the top. This is what you're looking at on the left-hand part of your screen. This collection of old and new laws could prescribe harsh punishments. The most famous is the principle of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It should be pointed out that the legal records that have survived from this era tend to indicate that the harshness of the laws were often softened in practice. Most of the laws on Hammurabi's code regard the family, like divorce and inheritance, or else the ownership of land or commercial transactions. Hammurabi claimed that these laws came from the gods, and that he was a representative of the gods for his people. As such, he was at the top of the social hierarchy, followed immediately by his warriors and priests. One step below these folks were the free people, in other words, peasants, tradesmen, etc., who weren't slaves. And slaves, perhaps obviously, were the lowest members of society. Slavery under the Babylonians was often temporary. A free person could be enslaved if he couldn't pay a debt and he would be freed if he could work off that debt by labor. Slaves could also conduct business and own property like non-slaves, and they could potentially buy their freedom. Other slaves were often prisoners of war. The Amorite slash Old Babylonian Empire eventually collapsed under an attack on two sides. From the north came the Hittites, a group that occupied what was known as Anatolia or Asia Minor, and is now part of the country of Turkey. The Hittites were only interested in plunder. They grabbed what they could carry and returned north to Asia Minor. We're going to cover the Hittites more fully in a later lecture. The other invaders were the Kassites, who attacked the Babylonians from the east, from modern-day Iran. The Kassites occupied much of southern Mesopotamia for the next 300 years. About 100 years later, around 1500 BC, a third people group, the Hurrians, set up the kingdom of Mitanni in northern Mesopotamia. They'd survived there for a century until they were conquered by the Hittites. As I noted earlier, the Sumerians were the first civilization to develop writing around 3000 BC. It appears as if much earlier, possibly as early as 8000 BC, humans had begun to use tokens as representations for keeping track of goods. These would be replaced by true writing by the Sumerians who carved impressions on the clay tablets. The writing implement, known as a stylus, carved wedge-shaped chunks out of the clay, which would then harden into a recognizable shape. The script developed by the Sumerians is called cuneiform, which means wedge-shaped after the appearance of the script. You can see these chunky symbols in the picture I've provided to you. At first, these shapes were symbols that represented the intended objects, and these are known as pictographs. Eventually, the Sumerians developed symbols to represent ideas, known as ideograms. Ultimately, the Sumerians also began to use certain symbols to represent the syllables of a spoken word, and these are known as phonetic symbols. Sumerian cuneiform, therefore, combined pictographs with ideograms with phonetic symbols. The Sumerians never went beyond representing syllables to representing individual sounds, and so they did not employ an alphabet with letters. Because of these various combinations, there are over 600 symbols in Sumerian cuneiform, all of which must be memorized to make sense of a tablet. As a result, it was a difficult language to learn, and was largely restricted to professional scribes. The Akkadians adopted the script, used it for their language, and spread it throughout their lands. Eventually, cuneiform began to be used not just for economic and administrative purposes, but religious and literary ends as well. 
Cuneiform was originally developed to aid business transactions, so numbers and math are clearly going to be an important element in the development of the Sumerian language. Archaeologists have deciphered the Sumerian mathematical system and discovered that it is sexagesimal. In other words, it is founded on a base 60 system rather than our decimal or base 10 system. Some elements of this sexagesimal system are still with us. There are 30 minutes in an hour, 30 seconds in a minute, and 360 degrees, or 6 times 60, in a circle. The Sumerian year had 12 months, each of which was divided into exactly 30, which is half of 60, days, in accordance with the travels of the moon around the Earth. Since this didn't line up with the solar year, or weather patterns, every few years a 13th month was inserted with leftover days to catch up. The Sumerians were expert engineers. After all, their civilization was founded on irrigation canals and flood control. Even more fundamental than this, however, was their discovery of the wheel sometime between 3500 and 3000 BC. The best existing examples of Sumerian engineering skill are ziggurats, the Sumerian religious structures. These highly sophisticated structures are multi-terraced, pyramid-like constructions with a temple at the top. Sumerians worshipped anthropomorphic gods, who were believed to behave like humans, but were immortal, powerful, capricious, and wrathful. Sumerians believed that the gods had to be appeased, or else they would destroy humanity, and this was evidenced every time the Tigris or Euphrates violently flooded. It was the job of the Sumerian priests to keep the gods happy. In addition to begging for mercy, the priests also tried to figure out what the gods wanted by developing the practice of divination. Divination involved studying the stars or the entrails of animals to try to figure out if there were any perceptible patterns. Sumerian religion was primarily focused on this life. They believed that the afterlife was a gloomy, uncertain place where the dead wandered aimlessly in shadows. The greatest piece of Sumerian literature is the Epic of Gilgamesh, although the Sumerians also had an epic poem known as the Enuma Elish that described the creation of the world. The Epic of Gilgamesh was written down on 12 cuneiform tablets sometime around 2000 BC. It describes the various quests of Gilgamesh, the king of Uruk, in an attempt to gain immortality. Perhaps the most famous scene from the Epic of Gilgamesh is the account of the Great Flood, and I will quote a brief passage here. For six days and six nights the winds blew. Torrent and tempest and flood overwhelmed the world. Tempest and flood raged together like warring hosts. When the seventh day dawned, the storm subsided, the sea grew calm, and the flood was stilled. I looked at the face of the world, and there was silence. All mankind turned to clay. These poems influenced religion in the Near East and suggest parallel accounts of various passages of other religious texts.